On today's episode of the show, we're going to talk about the true nature of reality and why it is that we live in an infinite and ever-expanding mind. Welcome back to the Beyond Homo Sapien podcast. This show is all about human evolution and the future of the species. Welcome to Season 7, The Victory. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe, give us a five-star review, and share this episode with a friend. So that way we can spread the word and help more people get this information. If you want to learn more about where the species is going and how you can contribute, go to beyondhomosapien.com. Thanks for tuning into the show. Let's begin. I want to start today's episode with a reading of a book. The book is The Phoenix by Manly P. Hall. I'm reading from page 169 very end of the book the mysteries taught that there are two kinds of men those who are awake and those who are asleep so according to the mysteries the ignorant lie sleeping sleeping through all eternity sleeping as worlds are made sleeping as worlds perish again sleeping as nations rise sleeping as empires fall surrounded by infinite opportunity and part of a plan based upon infinite growth Those who are not initiated into the mystery of reality sleep in their narrow coffins of egotism, selfishness, and unawareness through all the eternities of time and being. Those who are awake live in a world of infinite light, infinite wisdom, infinite beauty, infinite opportunity, and infinite progress. To such, all things are good. To such, there is no death, and gradually, they ascend that ladder of stars leading to the footstool of divinity itself. To these awakened ones, the universe is home, and the myriads of stars and heavenly bodies are kindred hosts of celestial beings. All the world is a laboratory of experimentation. Every stick and stone preaches a sermon. Every living thing teaches a lesson. But to the sleeping ones, the world is a cold and dismal place. Every man is an enemy. Every plant is poisonous or thorny. Every beast snaps and howls. Every stone is sharp. Every problem is a disaster. Always the clouds obscure the face of the sun and the heavenly lights are darkened. Life itself is a futile struggle against the inevitable and the grave its closing episode. Immortality is not the perpetuation of the body. It is an innate realization of the perpetuity of spirit. Once man gains consciousness of self, he can never lose it. Once he has learned to live, he cannot die, though his form may change. Life is the realization of life, and death is the lack of that realization. Could Plato, initiated into the nothingness of death, ever die? Could Socrates ever cease to be, who knew that by drinking the hemlock, he was but liberating himself from the bonds and limitation of a world which he could not understand? He realized that the fleshy house was not his real self, but that he changed his bodies as he changed his garments. Having arrived at the realization of truth, he was immortal. But what is truth? Whence comes the power which, when it is established in the soul of man, answers all things, solves all things, reveals all things, and supplies all things? What is that indescribable elixir which, when poured into the human soul, makes of the weakling a hero, of the poor man one of indescribable wealth, of the ignorant a divinely illumined sage, and of man a god? We hear much of truth. It is a word on every man's tongue, but in few men's hearts. Can it be revealed by one to another? Is it tangible, intellectual reality? Or is it an indescribable recognition of the relationship between the individual self and the universal self? What is this mysterious doctrine which lifts a man from the ranks of the mediocre and carries him to the very footstool of divinity? What is it that makes the martyr die with a smile upon his lips and with blessings for his executioners? What is it that inspires the artist to paint pictures which illuminate the world? What is it that sounds as soft music in the ears of the great composer? What is it that moves the pen of the author that he may write books which will live forever in the hearts and souls of humanity? The symbol of that great power is the crux and santa, the cross of life, that golden key which unlocks the mysteries of self, that golden key which all too often becomes a cross for the crucifixion of the illumined. 
And yet those who have this golden key smile at death, laugh at torture, and retiring into the sanctuary of themselves are sufficient for all their needs. This great and mysterious power, this power of divinely revealed truth, is what man gained when he was accepted into the hidden house of the hidden places. For it is said that the mysteries either found a good man or made one. And though he started upon the road a scoffer, he ended amazed and silenced. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. In college, I studied philosophy, and we would speak about this often, contemplating one of the most important questions, if not the most important question that a person can ask themselves. What is this reality? What is it that we are inside of here? How did this all come into being? What are the laws that govern this reality? Did someone create this reality or did it spring up out of nothing? But fundamentally, what makes up this reality? What composes it? What is it when I am knocking on this table next to me? What is it that I'm knocking on? Obviously, the table is made out of maybe wood or plastic, but at the end of the day, what is that composed of? And furthermore, once we answer that question, what is that composed of? What is the fundamental building block of reality? Who decides these things? Who came up with these laws or these rules or these things that we're even describing here? The words that I'm saying to you right now are communicated over invisible wavelengths that span the world, essentially. How is it that I'm able to project my ideas to you with my voice and you're able to somehow interpret that with your mind, with your consciousness, and somehow gather that information into your mind and compute it over there? How is it that we are allowed or able to have this dialogue across nations, across borders, and around the whole world. Invisibly, we are all connected. We are all one hive mind, one giant consciousness. We are all one hive mind and one consciousness. Who is it that ordained these things? How did they come to be? And on and on and on. If you've studied philosophy, this subject should not be a stranger to you. This is the foundation of philosophy. And as Socrates said, philosophy is preparing for death. It is a sort of purification process where you are confronted with reason, with logic, and at the end of the day, with uh, a sort of understanding that there's only so, so many things that we can really understand for sure. There's only so much that we can really depend upon but there are fundamental truths and there are fundamental things that we can deduce logically about reality and about uh, especially what happens after this reality that make things a lot more pleasant here inside of this reality. <laughs> These are the same teachings that have been echoed by all great teachers in one form or another, whether we're talking about Jesus or Hermes Trismegistus or the Buddha or anyone really who is worth learning about from antiquity they were all initiates of an ancient religion an ancient teaching that goes back older than recorded time this teaching is the oldest and most dominant religion in the world because it has weaved itself into all of the others it is at the foundation of all spiritual truths and all true seekers know what I'm talking about. The teaching has many names, uh, such as the religion with no name, <laughs> the mystery religion, uh, the wisdom religion, the ancient mysteries. You might hear about them referred to as the mysteries. And these teachings have been under a number of different names. Hermeticism, Gnosticism, Neoplatonism. Christianity is one form of this religion. Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, they are all in one form or another different forms of the ancient teaching. They all have different variations, they have different perspectives, different understandings, but allegorically at the end of the day, they're all preaching the same doctrine. Not just that, but all of science 
the more that we go down the rabbit hole of quantum physics and understanding more about the foundational makeup of reality uh, also validates the ancient teachings and also uh, extols what they are saying, but using a different vocabulary and in a new, uh, a new way of describing it. Obviously, quantum physics is very complicated, but the fundamental things that they are discovering are very, very similar to what was taught in the ancient mysteries. And also, just to be clear, I obviously was not around in the ancient mysteries. You weren't either, because the real ancient mystery schools existed thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. However, their descendants, energetically, are still around today, and uh, a lot of folks have written plenty of books about what was taught at those ancient schools. In fact, Plato was one such person. Aristotle, another. Isaac Newton, Pythagoras, Alexander the Great, Jesus, and so many others. All initiates of the ancient mysteries. So, whether you believe this or not, uh, I'm not asking you to. It's something that must be experienced. However, here is what these ancient teachings have found about the nature of reality. They say that we live inside of a great cosmic mind, that essentially the universe is mental. That doesn't mean that we live inside of our own minds or that this is all happening in your head, but rather that the fundamental thing that makes up all of reality is some form of consciousness. That we live essentially inside of the mind of a great being that we all make up. The best uh, way to understand this, I've found, is in the book The Kabbalion. I've done an episode on The Kabbalion in the past, but a really interesting book that dives into this topic in great detail. And in that book, it talks about kind of using the allegory of an author and his creations. So let's use the example of Tolkien and Frodo Baggins. So Frodo Baggins exists inside of the mind of J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, in a sense, Frodo is Tolkien. Like, But on the other hand, Frodo is obviously not all of Tolkien. There's also Aragorn, Samwise Gamgee, Gandalf, Sauron, Morgoth, and everything else that exists in that world. They all existed inside of the mind of Tolkien. He put a little bit of himself in each of those different characters to the point where he was invested in the story uh, and he put a part of himself inside of that story, essentially. And this is what any great author does. They put a part of themselves in the characters that they're creating and these characters take on a life of their own. They become almost just this tool of creative imagination that the author then uses to create and kind of craft the story. Stephen King talks about this idea too in his book On Writing. This idea that the things that the author creates in their head become almost real, especially from the perspective of the author. But it's amazing because it's actually a part of yourself that you are exploring and kind of creating almost uh, from, from nothing, just from your imagination. And it exists inside of the world that you created in your mind, but it begins to take form Uh, The more energy that you give it, the more you write about that character and so on. So, but Frodo doesn't exist anywhere else except in the mind of Tolkien until he also enters the collective consciousness. He also now exists in a sense in the physical world because Elijah Wood portrayed him in the movie. So for a time, Elijah Wood became Frodo Baggins and he took on a part of J.R.R. Tolkien and his energy into that and channeled that into this plane in a sense. So he almost allowed Frodo to jump into this dimension for a little window of time. And now you can get a a picture of that whenever you watch the movies, which further embeds this idea into the collective mind. And the more we talk about Frodo Baggins and the more that we, you know, get him out there, the more people watch The Lord of the Rings, the more people read about it or think about it or talk about it, the the more Frodo lives on, but essentially the more J.R.R. Tolkien, the man, lives on in our world. So although he's not actually here in the world, he essentially lives on energetically speaking. And so long as Frodo Baggins is is talked about and thought about and read, 
then Tolkien will always be with us. So the same is true for how God creates. We exist inside of the mind of God in the same way that Frodo exists inside of the mind of Tolkien, however, at a different level of correspondence. So again, going back to the Kabbalion, it talks about this idea of the seven planes of correspondence and the different subdivisions within each of those different planes. Put simply, it's this idea that there's different dimensions stacked on top of each other that exist uh, alongside each other, essentially. But they ascend upwards like a ladder. So passing through these different planes of consciousness is similar to undergoing a type of evolutionary experience, much in the same way that Frodo Baggins leaped out of the mind of J.R.R. Tolkien and then into the physical world over time. In much the same way, you came into being as a, as a thought in the mind of the creator. However, the creator is you and me and everything around us. Everything is God and God is in everything because God is essentially consciousness. As said by Eliphas Levy, reason is God, logic, the great thought from whence everything came. The concept is that we are all this great deity and little parts of this deity are in each one of us. So it's a spiritual idea because obviously there is this conception of God or a creator, uh, but then there's also kind of this practical understanding. When you understand this, when you awaken to it, there's actually a practical application because you begin to uh, gain more awareness and have a greater control over your life. And more and more, you move up these kind of planes of correspondence and eventually you have a ability to create really whatever you want because you've come into this full awareness. And it's an awareness that is due to everyone in a sense. So everyone can inherit this, this awareness and there's nothing special about any of us who have kind of realized that because that's all it is, it's a realization. So earlier I mentioned that science is finding many of the same things uh, the further that quantum physics is pursued. What is being discovered is that at its core, everything has a sort of wavelength at the bottom. That whatever is composing this universe, it appears to be a sort of wavelength, a sort of frequency, perhaps. And this frequency is, per is uh, permeated throughout the entire universe and the universe is infinitely expanding in all directions in that it is happening in all places and all times simultaneously. Furthermore, that the universe is somehow alive inherently as a result of this wavelength. Now, if you're a quantum physicist and I just butchered that explanation, or if I don't understand something, please reach out to me. I would love to be educated more on this topic. However, this is my understanding uh, having studied these things. Furthermore, if you've ever heard of superfluid vacuum theory, this concept that essentially everything inside of the universe is a liquid with a viscosity of zero. In other words, uh, it's the idea like it's a completely clear liquid that you can't really feel, kind of like a steam. So steam, for instance, has a lower viscosity than still water in a lake. So imagine steam taken to the nth degree with a viscosity of zero. So basically a liquid that you cannot see or feel or sense or have any composure of, but it's a liquid nonetheless. Almost as, as if we live in sort of a type of brain fluid. So again, these are the things that the ancient mystery teachings have been teaching in one form or another since the dawn of time, basically, is that we live inside of a great mind. Everything that you see around you is consciousness that we are essentially a thought in the mind of the creator, almost like we live inside of a dream, uh, a dream of some great cosmic being that we all are. But uh, it's a dream that you can wake up inside of, and people have been waking up inside of, again, since the dawn of time. So you have those teachings on the one hand, and then on the other, you have everything that's being discovered by quantum physics. And then right in the middle, you have you and your experience. So this is where the rubber meets the road, is you have to go and have experience and just 
play around with this concept and, and try to see what does it actually mean. But if it is true, then it would give you, this, give you the idea that uh, you create your reality, that your thoughts basically do have a causative effect, that somehow, some way, your thoughts and the vibration coming out of you at every moment is uh, having an impact on the world around you constantly. And that impact is then creating and manifesting the reality in which you find yourself. With this idea goes another idea, which is that we are all one being. That can sometimes be a bit of a weird idea, for sure. Because obviously, I'm different than you, you're different than me, and uh, my cat, for example, is very different than both of us. The birds that I hear in the distance, very different than both of us. They're having a very different experience. We are each other, but we're also very different. Essentially, you or me living a different life. So if we were ever to get together, we could share our experiences and we could talk and see what the other experience is like. And I hope that we get to someday. But that's what I've been finding the last few years that I've been doing this research is that this is the teaching that is fundamental to all of it, that we live inside of this great mind and that when you really awaken to that understanding, it really kind of opens up a new pathway for you. But it's a pathway that you have to actually take and you have to actually start playing with to really understand. And at the end of the day, you just have to see for yourself and let, uh, let the results speak for themselves. However, what I'd invite you to understand is that really belief is one of the most powerful forces that we have. When Jesus' disciples asked him to perform miracles, he would always ask the person, do you believe? And why is that important? It's important because if you really are a part of God, and if you really do have that full potential at your fingertips, then what you believe really matters one way or the other. Whether you know it or not, you're having a massive impact on the environment around you through the beliefs that are happening in your head and carried through your body. So one of the first things to do if you do want to get started on this this path is just believe in it just a little bit. Because really, belief is one of the most powerful things that we have at our fingertips. So when you believe in the power of belief, it becomes more powerful. So if you're looking for a place to start, I'd suggest you start there. I know earlier I said I wasn't asking you to believe in this stuff, but uh, it is a it does help. Otherwise, I will have hoped that you found this podcast interesting, and I hope you learned more. This is what was taught by the ancient mysteries. This is what is being found by our scientists today. And this is what I have experienced in my life the past few years since I awakened to this stuff. So if you're on a similar path, you're not alone, and there's nothing wrong with you. Actually, you're picking up on some of the most ancient and powerful information of all time. That we really do create our realities. We really are having a causative effect on the environment around us through our thoughts, through our beliefs, and through our actions. The reason why is because we live in this great mind and consciousness is at the foundation of all reality. So if you enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend. I hope you learned something and have a wonderful week.